To the best of my memory and writing style, this is a complete accounting of what I experienced 33 years ago. My intent is to record this while I still am able. The reader should appreciate that some of this is memory that I did not want to ever remember. I tried to push it from consciousness. Over the years, I have tried to focus only on the good and not on the evil. But I am acutely aware that there are both. This is my account. It happened to me, and I am stuck with it. The year is 1990. I'm 14 years old, and it is the summer of my freshman year of high school. I applied to work at a Boy Scout summer camp for the third year running. The first two summers I applied, I wasn't offered a position. This year was my last chance, and the camp director offered me a job working in the camp kitchen. It's not what I had in mind, but I accepted. The camp ran like clockwork. Each Saturday, all of the scouts left the camp, and on Sunday, a new bunch of troops arrived. On the first day of their arrival, campers were required to pass a swim test to be allowed to participate in lake activities. Since working the kitchen was hard with little time off, and since I was a certified junior lifeguard, I volunteered to watch over the new campers as they performed their swim test. Each of the guards was supplied a long aluminum pole to act as a lifeline in case someone had to be pulled dockside. Swimmers were required to swim two laps unassisted along a boat slip bordered on three sides by dock. For the swim test, the open side was bounded by buoys along a length of rope. On this particular day, I had watched several groups perform their test without incident. However, during one of the evaluations, one swimmer, a boy of 13 years old or so, started to struggle and cried out for assistance. All I had to do was lower the pole so he could grab on, and I would pull him out. But, instinctively, my lifeguard training came into play, and I jumped feet first into the water with legs spread apart like on a bicycle. Quickly, I grabbed the boy, spun him around, and placed him in a carry position with my arm across his chest diagonally. It is a very secure hold, and one that prevents him from fighting me if he panics. Since he was quite docile, and since this hold is tiring, I decided I could place him in a chin carry instead. That was a mistake since the boy felt less secure and became anxious. In a split second of panic, and before I knew what happened, he struck the side of my head with a roundhouse right hook. The blow to my head was severe and dazed me. I fought to maintain consciousness. As my awareness slipped from me, I began to sink into the water, deeper and deeper. Because I had been exerting myself carrying the boy back to dockside, my body needed oxygen. My chest instinctively heaved, forcing my lungs to breathe water into them. To my amazement, it wasn't so bad. My lungs were full, which took the pressure off, but I knew I was going to die today. I felt my arms and body go limp. I was sinking, watching the water go from light green to dark. What's happening? What is that? It doesn't make sense. I think I see people running here and there along wooden paths. Oh, that's water I see, and those are the wooden docks. The boy I was saving is alone in the water now. He's looking around frantically. He's crying. I get it. I'm floating above everything, and I'm looking down onto the lake and the docks. I don't see me because I'm underwater. But how can I be seeing this? Why? I'm at maybe 50 feet above the water. I want down. I belong down there. How do I get down? As if I have a rubber band attached to my back that reaches its limit, I am pulled higher into the sky. Holy cow, I don't see the lake anymore. I'm in the clouds. The earth pulls away from me. I can see it and it's getting smaller. I'm in space. It's dark except for the stars. Slowly they start to move, streaking the black backdrop and forming lines of light. As I pick up speed, I feel I am moving to the end of the universe with the stars whizzing by me. The lights create a walled effect like warp drive in Star Trek. I'm moving fast, faster than is possible, yet there is no real sensation except for sight, then into darkness. It's black, pitch black. I see nothing. There is nothing. I strain to see something, anything. I don't like this. I'm scared. I feel I am in a universe devoid of all things. It is vast without end and completely and utterly empty. There is no one else, nothing else. I am alone. 
There is no person, no life, no death, no love, no hate, no salvation. There is only a vast emptiness except for me. The loneliness overwhelms my senses. I would welcome anything. Please, please, I can't stay here. Wait, I see something. Do I hear something too? Is my mind playing tricks? I hear laughter. I don't know if I like the sound of it, though. I see a pinpoint of light. It's getting larger, but I can't make out what, if anything, it is. The laughing is getting louder, too. The light starts to form a shape. Huh? I can't believe what I am seeing. It can't be. It is. It can't be. I see a face. Except it's not a face. I don't quite recognize it because it's a skull and it's laughing. It isn't a good laugh. It's sinister. He's mocking me, gleeful at my plight. It's a terrible sound that sends shudders through me. It speaks and tells me I am there forever, with him. I begin to hear others talking. They are coming nearer with conspiratorial voices that are evil and menacing. The skull brought them or they followed. I'm scared. I feel their presence encircling me. These are creatures of the darkness. I can't see them. I sense them. They're near. They are as dark as the surroundings. The skull continues laughing. Ouch! Something clawed me, and I am being bit as if being tasted. Then they are set loose upon me, clawing, scratching, and biting. It feels like my skin is being stripped off. Oh, the pain. God, help me, please. I can't take this. God, please help me. The attacks continue. Then I recall an old parish priest told me that evil cannot remain in the presence of God. I call out, Lord Jesus Christ, help me, please, help me. The attacks subside and soon stop altogether. The dark entities of evil slink away into the darkness. I am alone again in the black emptiness, but I am relieved. Some moments later, I see something again. It's another pinpoint of light. Oh God, please don't let it be that skull again. It's coming closer and separates into more than one light. What are these? They get larger. They look like soap bubbles, lots of soap bubbles. Lots and lots and lots of soap bubbles. They're everywhere. Hundreds, thousands, and then millions of them. The colors are magnificent, lively, and translucent. Each bubble dances about in its own way. They are alive. They don't harm me. They are good. I'm confused why I am seeing this. What are they? The bubbles begin to move past me, slowly at first, and then faster. I'm moving, or they are. I'm not sure which. The movement of the bubbles past me generates streaks of red and violet light bars, encapsulating me into a tube of colored light culminating in a faraway vortex. I have no choice but to move through it. When I reach the end, I hear, it is time to review your life experiences. Who's there? Who said that? I don't see anyone. I'm the one watching over you. Are you my guardian angel? If you like, yes. It was nice to be in the presence of another. And with that, like watching a big movie screen, my life was portrayed before me, instance by instance, moment by moment. It would be normal to think that this would take some time, but time doesn't exist. There's Billy. He's about five or six years old. I used to play with him when I was a little kid. We're playing with cars behind the orange brick duplex across the street from where I live. I say something bad to Billy. It's not a nice thing. I'm being mean and spiteful. The difference now is I feel him hurting. He's crying. I feel his anguish. Oh, I'm sorry, Billy. I shouldn't have hurt you like that. And so it went on, moment by moment, review by review, feeling the results of my actions until my time in the lake. Why am I going through this? My angel replied, You review your life in order to cleanse your soul. How do you feel? Terrible. I am such a mean person. I didn't realize I hurt others that much. It's important that you learn from this. I have. I take responsibility and I'm so sorry. Would you like to see it again? No, I get the message. I hope that I am not judged poorly. Your life is evaluated by the most powerful judge there is. When does that happen? It already has. That judge is you. It all becomes clear to me, and I feel as if a weight has been removed. I am refreshed. I am ready now. The cleansing is over, and I am left in darkness once again, but not for long. Wow, a blast of light like a door opening into the darkness. I'm confronted with streaks of bright, white, brilliant light. It's overwhelming. 
It is the purest and whitest light I have ever seen. It covers me like a blanket. Light this bright should be impossible to look at, but it isn't. It's warm and wonderful. The light bathes me with a glow of overpowering love and inner peace. It's absolutely wonderful. I move closer. Someone is standing in the doorway. Streaks of white light stream around his body. He's dressed in a white robe. His arms are down, outstretched with palms upward. I can't seem to make out his face no matter how hard I try. There's too much light. We have been waiting for you, but this isn't your time to be here. I know that voice. He is familiar to me. Why can't I recognize who you are? I must know you. I feel such a sense of inner serenity that I have never felt before. I like this place. I want to stay here. I sense that if I take his hand, I can stay. In fact, if I touch him, I must stay. I will not be allowed to return to my prior existence. I don't want to return. I reach out to him but can't quite touch him. Before you go, you may look into the future. He motions to his left. To my right, I notice a white table. It is stone, perhaps marble. On the table is a flat gold bowl filled with a liquid like oil or water. It's reflective and dark. Behind the table are three old men in white. Two are sitting, one is standing next to something like a pillar or a podium. There may be a book on it. They motion for me to come closer, and I do. Look into the bowl and see the future of mankind. I peer into the black liquid and see devastation. Cities are on fire. It's horrific. I turn away. I don't want to see this. Why are you showing me this? We want you to take a message back with you. Man must change his ways. But I'm only one person. What can I do? Spread the message, he continued. You have a special ability. I know he was referring to my paranormal senses. I am going to ask you a question. Whatever is your first response is the one we will accept. You cannot change your mind afterward. Do you understand? Yes, I do. What's the question? Do you want these powers you have and the ability to see into the future? Immediately, I respond, no, I just want to be normal. Very well, then. It is done. I withdraw from this area, and once again I find myself before the man in the white robe blocking my access. I want to enter. It feels so wonderful here. Can I stay here? You have work yet to do. You cannot remain. It is not your time. But I want to stay. Please, let me. I will show you something. With that, three small bubbles appeared from the darkness on the left. They get larger. They are like the bubbles I had seen before. As they get nearer, I can see the faces of three small children, two boys and one girl. Who are they? They are your children. But I'm only 14. I don't have any children. You will, and these are them. Don't you see? You must return in order for these children to be born. As I look at their faces, I realize one bubble stands off from the other two. Why is he separate? He is never born. He is your child, but he will remain here. Huh? How can that be? He's not born, but he's my child. You will understand one day. You must remember that while he remains here, he exists and that he loves you. With that said, the other two children depart, becoming smaller until they disappear. It is now time that you return. I try again to reach out and touch him, but I am being yanked backward. The light becomes smaller. I am in darkness again, moving backward. I know I am returning. Then, crack. With a jolt, I am back in my body. I find that I am sitting on the bottom of the lake in the mud. I have to get up for air. My legs flex. My arms start to paddle upwards. Will I make it? I don't think I can. It's got to be 10 or 12 feet or more. I need air. Struggling, I finally feel air with my right hand. With another stroke or two, I break the surface. Immediately, I cough up water from my lungs. The swimming boy is terrified. I see it in his eyes. He begins to help me. That's ironic. Still coughing and gasping, little by little, I get air into my lungs and it feels good. One of the senior waterfront instructors runs towards us down the dock. Quickly, I resume pulling the boy to shore. I'm exhausted, but somehow I manage to do it. The boy is saying, I was helping you. 
I cut him off and push him up onto the dock with the assistance of the senior instructor. He congratulates me on saving the boy. I'm dazed and confused. I say nothing and get out of the water. My body is intact, but my mind reels with what just happened. Prior to this episode in my life, I had many paranormal experiences. Afterward, the activity subsided. It wasn't eliminated by any means, but I can live with it and interpret things better. All in all, the old men I had talked to made me normal, and I am grateful. Over the years, I have asked myself why a 14-year-old would encounter such an evil entity. After all, how bad can a 14-year-old boy's life be that he should deserve such treatment? I have concluded that mine was an unplanned journey to the other side, so family members and friends there were not prepared for my arrival. Since no one knew I was coming, I became a target of opportunity for the dark side entities. Conversely, I like to think at the appropriate time, someone will help me navigate a safe passage. At the time of this near-death experience, I was a Catholic. Afterward, I continued to go to a Catholic school. In fact, the school was a pre-seminary grooming school for boys for the priesthood. But I was changed. Religion, any religion, didn't matter to me anymore. I no longer saw the church as the end point, but rather as a vehicle some people use to the end point. My view now centers on the concept of a creator with a divine plan that is revealed to us at his pace in his own time. Had I met the creator? I don't know. An interesting side note to this story is that I studied classical Greek the following two years in school. During that time, I learned of the ancient Greek belief in the fates. These were old sages typically depicted in white robes with white beards. If I recall correctly, there were three of them. One fate determined a person's time of birth, another the time of death, and the third measured a man's life. I have to admit that the similarity to my near-death experience unnerved me when I learned of this. Could I have talked to the fates? Years later, I met the woman I would marry. Although she still doesn't believe me, the very instant I saw her, my head went bowing like a spring releasing its energy. I instantly knew I had met my future wife, and as predicted, we had three children, although one was miscarried and was never born. And so, indeed, I did come to understand. What else have I learned? I know that our actions affect others in both positive and negative ways, and that we will come to appreciate this fact in the next place. I know there are indeed evilness and goodness, darkness and light, suffering and serenity. I know that mankind has the capability of extinguishing itself. But above all else, I know that our souls, our being, what it is that we are, does not die. The journey continues for us beyond this world. At a minimum, we gain a new perspective in the next place. It just may not be a complete understanding of all things. And while we search for the solution to life's equation, we may return to this world in a new instantiation, but wearing the same fabric of our existence. I also like to think that we are born afresh with those other souls with whom we choose to travel. That is how I recognized my wife when I first saw her. And so it is. After every life we live, we become stronger and truer, tempered by our experiences until such time as we may complete our journey and we are truly born.